My sermon notes today are kind of short, but do not let that fool you, because the text is long. So get out your Bibles, go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. We're going to look at, um, uh, continue our series on rethinking the church, and I want to make sure we're all clear on our definitions again. We're not talking about the purpose of your faith, we're talking about the purpose of gathering together, okay? And last week, I posited to you that one of the reasons why church is declining in the United States is because we have misunderstood, or at the very least misapplied, the purpose of the church, making it self-focused, the church about the attender rather than about God. And it's interesting because that was not the conclusion that was in my notes, my notes concluded very differently. It wasn't contradictory, it just wasn't the same conclusion. And the conclusion at the bottom of the notes that I had was leading into the next sermon, which is what we're going to have today. So last week I told you that you don't go to church for you, and today I'm going to explain to you why church is so good for you. And it's interesting because as I laughed at myself as I was preparing this sermon, God showed me something interesting. You know, we know that love is selflessness, and we're supposed to love our neighbor, and we're supposed to be selfless, but it's really hard to teach on selflessness because you seem to contradict yourself all the time because being selfless is good for you. So, you know, it's one of those things where how do I talk about don't doing things for your benefit, just do it because God says, yet everything God says is good for you. So, yes, there is benefit to obeying God even if you shouldn't do it for the benefit. Just had to get that out there. All right. So we talked about the selfless nature of attending church, and then we asked the question, why do we attend church? And I asked you to ask yourself that question over the week. Why is it that I was there last week? Why am I here today? What is it that I'm hoping to accomplish through attending church? Now, before we get to some of the answers to that question, I want to define church, because I think I... I think I may have left this out last week a little too much. I made a note of it just a little bit, and I don't think everyone caught it. So I want to talk about it a little bit. In Acts chapter 2, if you're there, go to verse 42. Let's read a few verses here, 42 through 47. And we'll take a look and see what church was like for those in not the first century, the first year. In fact, I'm pretty sure this was within the first month or two of, uh, of Pentecost. Okay, So let's read this together. Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47. They, being the church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. So we've got a lot of things going on here in these church services. First of all, there's teaching, okay? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Then there's also fellowship, and that's mentioned in several places. Uh, the breaking of bread and a prayer, just so you guys know, breaking of bread, when we think of that, we think of the Lord's Supper. But they didn't celebrate the Lord's Supper the way, to, the way we do today. The Lord's Supper to them was a meal in which you broke bread and, and remembered the cross of Christ. So it would be kind of like having communion in the middle of a fellowship dinner, would sort of how that would go, okay? Um, but you may also notice that it says they, uh, uh, well, we'll get to it here. Verse 44, all the believers were together, okay? So a lot of fellowship, they had everything in common. Um, verse uh, 46, every day they continued to meet together. They broke bread in their homes, that's sharing meals with one another and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. So there was teaching, there was a lot of fellowship, there was worship in the breaking of bread. In uh, uh, It also talks about, um, where was that? I really should have laid this out a little better because it's kind of sk- it kind of skips around. Uh, every, every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts. That was a worship service where they would get together and then verse 47, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. So there's worship going on, there's teaching going on, there's fellowship going on, there's even benevolence where they would sell property and give to those who have need. So it, it didn't look like today's modern church. And that's not an accusation against today's modern church, okay? I'm not saying that we're doing church wrong because it wasn't like that in the first century. That was a very specific set of circumstances that allowed them to do that, okay? 
But what I do want to point out is that church was not just a one-day thing. You know, the, the word church means a gathering, okay? That's why we call you a congregation, because you congregate together. And so any time they would get together and be blessed through fellowship or teaching or learning or study or benevolence or service or whatever it is, that was church. And so when I say, when we talk about the purposes of church, not the purposes, excuse me, the benefits of church today, I want you to understand that I'm not just talking about this, okay? This is important. But church carries with you outside that door because the church is you. You are the church. And so as you get together outside those doors, church happens. I had the uh, uh, benefit of uh, inviting another family over um, from the church, and they came over, and we, we uh, had uh, s'mores, <laughs> barely. I have never had more troubles having a fire than I did yesterday. And the wood was dry, but it would not burn. Anyway, so we would stick our marshmallows like in between the logs to get them to burn. Anyway, uh, we had fun. And, you know, uh, we spent time talking about all sorts of things. But we spent some time talking about God and talking about faith and talking about the Bible. And we were able to encourage one another. And I remember uh, the wife, as they were leaving, she said, we'll see you at church on Sunday. And I said, did you miss it? We just had church. I mean, come on Sunday, but that was church. We just did it. Because church isn't about getting together on Sunday mornings once a week. That's just for convenience. So we have a time regularly meeting. They met together daily in the temple courts and in each other's homes. Now, does that mean you have to give up your job and spend all time together? No. But it does mean that any time you get together with other believers, any time you have everything in common, you know each other and care for each other's needs, any time you have a meal with another believer, Anytime you're blessed by sharing time together, that's church. And I'll show you why here in a little bit. No, I'll show you why right now. So our purpose of gathering together is not for our benefit. And we'll get to the purpose next week, hopefully. But that doesn't mean you don't get benefit out of church. Okay? Anytime you fellowship with other believers, there should be a benefit that you garner from that. Sometimes in a, in a corporate setting like this, sometimes in a private setting one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes in a family setting, it doesn't matter. So what I want to do is, if you want to follow along, you're welcome to try, but for time's sake, we've got uh, 12 verses today, and they're all over the New Testament, so I recommend you write down the references or download the sermon notes on Tuesday when they go up. But I, want to, I need to go through the verses fairly quickly. And we're going to talk about four different benefits that you can get from church. And the first one is protection. Protection. Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 31. This is, Paul is uh, on his way to Rome, and he has, uh, I think it was Ephesus, but he's meeting with the, what we would call the pastors, literally the elders, okay? But they were the leaders of the, the various home churches in Ephesus, okay? And he's talking to them. In verse 28, he says, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. By the way, that, well, it says that after that, be shepherds. That's why I call them pastors, because that's where that word comes from. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he brought, bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. One of the benefits you get out of fellowshipping with other believers is protection, especially if it's a church, an official, what we would call a church, like Christian Fellowship Church. You have elders, you have a pastor, you have shepherds amongst the congregation. And they are there to offer you many things, but one of them is protection. Protection from what? Well, according to Paul, in this particular case, he's offering protection against heresy, against people leading you astray. And I think one of the problems in our society today is that no one treated the shepherds like shepherds. They treated them like hired hands. And so the shepherds were unable to lead the congregation, and the congregation wandered off into uh, error and ended up leaving the church. I was chatting with an individual just yes, well, a couple days ago, and um, I won't tell you which congregation she went to, but uh, she was complaining how liberal her denomination had become. And she asked me, well, how did that happen? I said, I think this is part of it. 
because people didn't listen to sound teaching anymore. They went their own way. Okay, so we're there to offer protection. But it's not just from the pastors and elders. Okay, in James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, he's talking to the whole church. He says, My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. It's not just the shepherds that are there to protect you from from wandering astray. It's from the other believers too. When we fellowship and we really allow people into our lives, they can help keep us on the path God has for us rather than wandering off after our own desires. In uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, we see a very similar concept. 2 Peter 3 verse 17 The apostle says, Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fail or fall from your secure position. So we see another warning to not drift away, not fall away, and that warning often comes through people in the church. So you can have protection from fellowshipping together with other believers. That's the first one. The second one is instruction. You can receive instruction. The first example is from Acts chapter 15. I'm not going to read it because it's a really long story. But basically, uh, Paul was going around saving Gentiles, okay? And there were Jewish people that were claiming that you have to be circumcised and follow the law of Moses to be a Christian. Paul didn't agree with that. So he, he and these other people went to Jerusalem to talk to the apostles and say, what do you think? And get a decision from them. They call it the Jerusalem Council. Okay, It was the first grouping of leaders to make theological decisions. And they decided that, no, Gentiles don't have to follow the law of Moses, which is great because I love bacon. And uh, that's the first example of teaching coming down from those in authority. And when you're a part of a fellowship, when I love the fact that we're Christian fellowship church, when you're part of a fellowship, you have an authority structure to help you understand the truth. Another good example, Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 through 25. And uh, this is Paul talking to Timothy, who was a... Um, Uh, Well, some would call him an apostle. He was an authority over uh, several churches. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. So what's one of the purposes of authorities placed over a fellowship of believers? It's to, to not be quarrelsome, And I've met some quarrelsome preachers before. I'm sure everybody has, okay? But to not be quarrelsome, but rather be able to teach and gently instruct. So you can receive instruction from being part of a fellowship. But guess what? It doesn't just come from this, okay? In 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 12 through 15, let me show you something. I loved this when I was preparing this message. 1 Thessalonians 5, starting in verse 12. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Now he's talking about elders and pastors, you know, apostles, prophets, uh, evangelists, pastors, and preachers and teachers. Anyway, um, the fivefold ministry. He's talking about the leaders in the church, okay? So he tells the church in Thessalonica to hold them in the highest regard. To, uh, to acknowledge them and to love them because of their work, okay? But then he continues to talk to the people, the, the average church member, not leaders, and he says, live in peace with each other. And then in verse 14 he says, and we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the dishear- disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone, make sure nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and everyone else. You see, instruction doesn't just come from the top. It doesn't just come from the front. It's supposed to come from everybody. And you say, well, I I can't instruct. I don't know enough. Do you know anything? (laughs) Okay, then you can instruct. Because if you know something that somebody else doesn't know, you can instruct them in that. And what Paul's describing here is what I call positive peer pressure. You guys remember the story of the baboons? Anybody remember the story of the baboons? Baboon troop? Okay, I'll tell it real fast. A group of baboons, and baboons are mean. They're just mean. Their social structure is based on violence and, and bullying, okay? And uh, 
they all got into some spoiled food and all the bullies died because bullies get the most food. So all that was left were nice baboons. And this troop developed a new social structure that the scientists had never seen before where they actually developed a hierarchy based on who was nice. And the nicest baboon got the best treatment by everybody else. And I love that story because it's such a perfect illustration of how a church should work. Because when new baboons would come into the troop, well, they're used to the meanest one gets to the top. So he'd start beating up baboons to try to work his way up the ladder. And all the baboons would gang up on him and beat him until he realized, okay, I guess you have to be nice. And new baboons would develop this nice attitude rather than the mean one. That's how church should work. We should have a culture based not on authority, based not on force, based not on cruelty or bullying. We should have a culture based on loving and kindness and generosity because whoever wants to be first has to be and the no and the servant of all. Yeah. I was having a conversation with we were I'm doing a Bible study with a young couple and uh, and we were sitting down and we got to that verse. And I said, what do you think that means? And he said, I have no idea. And I said, let me tell you a little bit about my story <laughs> and how I had to learn how to be a servant before I could be a leader. And that attitude, that positive peer pressure works where we're in this big group and people learn through example not to, uh, well, what does it say here? Um, uh, urge your brothers to warn those who are idle and disruptive. So people who are, that basically means busybodies, people who, who are, don't have enough to do and they go around place to place talking negative about everything, okay? He's warned those people. Well, in a positive peer pressure environment, you don't have to because the, the negative people go to the other people and the other people are like, I, I don't want to hear that. It's none of my business. Frankly, it's none of your business. Please don't talk to me about that stuff again. Oh, I guess things work differently in this baboon troop. I just call y'all baboons. <laughs> that was unintentional. Okay, so positive peer pressure. So you've got protection from heresy, and there's, there's other protections we didn't get to because I had to cut some scriptures out, but there's protection. You can get instruction. You can also get edification. Edification is a fancy word for strength, okay, to be made stronger. And uh, a part of this I got from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. Uh, if you're familiar with the context, Paul is talking to the church at Corinth, and they've got division in them. Some say, I follow Apollos, I follow Paul, I follow Peter, I follow Christ. And everyone's arguing about you know, who the better teacher is. And Paul's trying to prove to them that there's one God, worship him. And he says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. And Paul's point is that growth, or we could say strength, comes from God. And that's the truth. But notice the first part that we never pay attention to. Paul still had to plant the seed. Apollo still had to water the seed. Now, can God make you strong without anyone planting seed and anyone watering seed? Yes, because God can do anything. Will he? Mm. Especially if there are people trying to plant seeds and you're saying, I don't want that. People trying to water the seed, I don't want that. God's not going to make you strong if you're resisting his normal pattern. <laughs> what, what did you say, Steve, earlier, you know? Uh, why didn't you save me, Lord, the man who drowns? Why didn't you save me? I sent you two boats and a helicopter. You guys know that joke? You know, that's the idea. God says, I'm sending you people. I'm sending you people to plant seeds in your heart, to water those seeds. I will make you strong. But if you don't have a fellowship, if you don't have people with you to help that process, then you will end up weak, or at least not as strong as you could be. In Ephesians 4, I'm going to prove that to you because that's that was a little weak argument, and you know, I'm kind of taking things not out of context, but I'm making an inference, but I want to show you in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, to maybe make this a little more solid, to edify my argument. In uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, Paul says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip people for the works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up, that's edify, until we all reach the unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and be, become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Did you know that the leaders that God gives you are a gift to make you strong? You know, we, we think, as Americans, we don't like leadership. 
We don't like anybody telling us what to do because we do it on our own. But Paul calls the fivefold ministry gifts. They're gifts to you to do what? To equip you and to edify you, or built up in this case, to reach unity in the faith, knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature and attain the whole fullness of Christ. Well, where is the fivefold ministry? It's in fellowship. Now, I've got some different opinions on the fivefold ministry than a lot of people who use that term. But I will say this, that the fivefold ministry exists, if nothing else, in the leaders that God appoints in a church. And I'll tell you, I'm not going to name names. I don't want to embarrass anybody. But I know that God has fivefold gifts in the elders in this church, not including myself. I've got some of them too. But I'm really glad we have the elders we do because they carry some of those fivefold gifts into this congregation. But there is a concept, and I, I've read the book, and I, I agree with the concept and principle, that every believer has those to some degree. Okay? And it's, it's if we fellowship with one another, we can become strong. We can become mature. We can become equipped. And without that, we are weak. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If you don't have fellowship with other believers regularly, and I'm not just talking about Sunday morning, I mean regularly. This is a small town. We should have no excuse for never seeing our fellow church members because you're just going to run into each other, okay? Uh, if you, I, I can't go get my mail without having three conversations, <laughs> you know, because that's just how it is in a small town. And we need to fellowship with one another because when we do, when we have church on the sidewalk outside the post office, we have an opportunity to use our gifts to build one another up, to strengthen one another. So we have protection, we have instruction, we have edification, and the last one is communion. Now, I'm not talking about communion, the Lord's Supper. I'm talking about community type of communion where we commune one with another. This comes from the concept in Acts 2, uh, 42, where, where we read at the very beginning, uh, where they, they met every day in the temple courts, they broke bread in their homes, they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. That's communion, or we could call it fellowship if we want to. Not everybody's social, and I'm surprisingly an introvert. I love talking with people. I really like my alone time, my quiet time. Ask my kids. <laughs> but, you know, if I'm walking down the street and I see someone I know, I have an instant desire to want to communicate with them. Why is that? Because if that person's a believer, they might be able to strengthen me, and I might be able to strengthen them. And I want, I want every opportunity I can to get everything I can because I know I've got a bad, or not a bad, a hard battle to fight. And so do all of you. And we need each other if we're going to have that strength. And it comes through community, through communion. Let me show you a couple things. In Romans chapter 1, verse 10, Paul is introducing himself to the Romans, and he says, in, in my prayers at all times, and I pray that I now at last, by God's will, uh, the way may be opened for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. What was one of Paul's reasons for going to Rome? So they could strengthen each other with their faith. You ever needed somebody else's faith where you're struggling and you needed someone to come alongside you and say, it's going to be okay. It's going to work out. We can do this because we have Christ. And man, it just, just warms your heart. It builds you up in the Lord. And it's great. That's communion. That's the community. That's fellowship. That's church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 25, Paul says this, So that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. That's fellowship, where we get together and we rejoice with each other when we rejoice. I, I had some friends that bought a car. Uh, was, this was last year, but they bought a car and, and they said, Hey, are you guys home? And I, I was on the computer having my alone time, you know. I said, yes. <laughs> and they said, we just bought a car. We want to show it to you. And, you know, my instinct said, you know, can I see it tomorrow? Because I'm really tired. But you know what God told me? Celebrate with those who celebrate. Rejoice with those who are rejoicing. And they're rejoicing right now. Let them come over. 
And they came over and took us for a ride in the car. And, you know, I don't know anything about cars. They were like, what do you think? Uh, it looks pretty. <laughs> it goes forward. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't really know. But, uh, but I, I rejoiced with them. We had a good time. We fellowshiped together and we encouraged one another. We praised God for the blessing because they needed a new car. And that is church. Driving around Hoxie. You celebrate with those who celebrate, but you also mourn with those who mourn. When someone loses a loved one or they're going through a crisis or something is wrong and you go beside them. And this was really hard for me to learn because I'm a teacher by nature. But you go beside them, you put your arm around them and you just stay. Don't say anything. You don't have any advice. No solutions. You're just there. And that, uh, that doesn't come naturally to me because when I'm upset, it's like, everyone just stay away. Uh, but... Uh, you know, that morning with people who mourn, that's church. That's fellowship. And we need to do that Sunday morning. We need to be there for each other Sunday morning. But we need to be there for each other Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You know, take Saturday off. No, I'm kidding. Saturday too. We need to be there for each other all the time because it is through that, through that fellowship that we receive protection, instruction, strengthening and edification, and communion. I want to read to you one more verse. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. We always talk about this when we're talking about church attendance. And, you know, honestly, I'm not sure we're using it exactly right, but I'm going to read it to you here. He says, not, get, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. And right, we talk about that church attendance. We should be going together. We should be meeting together. We shouldn't stop meeting together. But guess what he's talking about? We talk about Sunday morning. He's talking about being together. You don't have to do it on Sunday morning. Now, there are benefits to that, which we'll talk about next week. And we should meet together, but this is just meeting together. We should not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. And we always put a period there and we forget the rest of the verse. Guess how it ends? But encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Why do we meet together? To encourage one another. Now, here's the thought. I love that. Encourage one another all the more as the day approaches. Why is that? Well, because every day we've got new encouragement, right? And we should always be getting better in Christ and encouraging people. But here's the thought. Why do we need to encourage each other more and more as the day approaches? Because things get worse the closer we get to Christ's return. And we're going to need that encouragement more. And guys, just within the last couple of weeks, I have been face-to-face and nose-to-nose with the lies of the devil and the deception that our world is in that I had never seen before, in ways I had never seen before. And it nearly broke my heart. It almost broke my spirit. It was too close to my heart. And I cried out to Jesus, and he said, Micah, it's not going to get any better. Don't pray for it to get better, because it's not. I told you it's not. It's going to get worse. So encourage one another. Don't give up meeting together. Don't think, you know, I can coast, I'll be okay, I'll be okay, I'll be okay, and then suddenly you're not okay. It's kind of like Gary said, you know, when he was talking about his brother. Uh, you don't realize how bad you feel until you feel good. <laughs> and you're like, man, I was feeling really bad. We find ourselves down in the pits and we don't even know it because the decline has been so gradual. But folks, I'm telling you, the church in America is in serious trouble. I heard a, a, a it wasn't a prophecy, it was a, a what do you call that, um, prediction. Uh, I heard a prediction from a guy named Hugh Halter, and I'll show you his book next week, but uh, he said in in 20 years, the church that exists today, like the the, the churches that exist today won't be there. 20 years. He said church is going to look completely different in 20 years. Even if we go step it up, man, we got to do something different. We got to fix church decline. We got to fix this stuff. He said it doesn't matter because the people who care aren't going to be here anymore. And the only ones that are left are the ones that either don't love God and don't care about meeting together or meet together in a completely different fashion. And he said, we need to be careful that we don't worship church and we start worshiping God, which is why we go to church. Because in them, the church in America can survive. And I'm not talking about changing style, folks, okay? I'm talking about changing our purpose. We need to check why we go to church, not how we do church. Because if we understand that church is about everyday encounters with other believers, if we understand that church is about, hey, why don't you and your family come over for supper? I'm having something delicious. 
and you know, we'd love to have you. And just eating a meal together. Or, you know, hey, I'm going to cook s'mores with a fire that big in my backyard. Why don't you come over and have some fun with me? And then when they're there, turn the conversation to Jesus. It's not hard with other believers. Why don't we do that? Why don't we do that? Is it so hard to get together with each other? We need each other more than we know. And church, real church, happens when we take it that seriously. And we understand that we need to make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. So let's be wise. Let's be intentional. Let's do church every day, everywhere we are. Next week, we're going to talk about the correct purpose of church, which I already let slip. It's worshiping God like you didn't know that. And we're going to rethink church from this perspective. I'm not talking about changing how we meet together on Sunday. I'm talking about changing how we think about it, our purposes behind it. But for now, I want you to understand that belonging to a fellowship, whether your name is in the rolls or you just know everybody well, is a key to being successful as a Christian because God can do anything He wants, but He prefers to work through people. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, I thank You that You are a God who gave us each other, that we instinctively need that connection with one another. And I just pray, Father, that You would give us the strength to seek it out, to not just let church happen, but to make church happen. That as we fellowship with Your sons and daughters, our brothers and sisters, that we might receive the protection and instruction and strengthening and communion that we need. And Lord, I know that we're not here for us, but I know, Lord, that you gave church to us for us. So Father, I pray that in our lives we would see the truth and and follow after it every time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.